I would like to um, invite uh, Dr. James Fallon, um, Professor of Psychiatry and Human Behavior at the University of California, Irvine, for his insight. And um, we're going to, uh, Jim is going to talk for uh, five to ten minutes, and uh, there will be time for a few questions, uh, but we need to break precisely at noon. Thank Orlin and Ingrid for having me here. This is really a tremendous honor. I, my first ties with Norway, I mean, it was 20 years ago, were really scientific and academic in nature, and it's really quite uh, evolved from there for me personally. So I, I try to get back here whenever I can. Uh, besides this being a, you know, a wonderful idea, the, even though the Partnership for Change is it's an independent organization, but it's nested in and within and with uh, the, the Shared Societies Group and the Madrid Group. So uh, this is a, a really enlightened uh, concept, which I, I quite like. Uh, I always found Norway to be way too passive, you know, and, and, uh, and I always thought it was very sort of darling, this whole idea of Janteleuven, and uh, the, as naive, maybe as much as other, the rest of the world thinks that Americans are naive for very good reason. Uh, but a, a, part of, a part of my interest, uh, which really has to do uh, with Ukraine itself and with Putin and the nature of dictators. I'm very interested in the, the mindset and the, uh, the genetics, if you will, of, of dictators and, and other tyrants, uh, elected or not. And, you know, I, I was in Ukraine two years ago as a part of a number of films having to do with tyranny and also especially with the uh, Stalin, who used his own true psychopathy as a lever to burnish uh, a quite evil in Ukraine itself. And so I, I have, and also have some family members that are uh, from Ukraine. So I, I do have a natural interest in this, but the academic interest, and I think um, of social interest, has to do with this idea uh, that we look at dictators and, and anybody we don't really like as psychopaths. And psychopaths, even though the term doesn't officially exist in psychiatry, we know what it means. And it's really a conglomerate of, uh, of different traits, of about 20 different traits. And I want to talk about just a couple of those traits today that are so key in understanding a tyrant. Now, most tyrants, uh, dictators, uh, are not psychopaths, even though they have some of these traits. For example, uh, people find it surprising that almost all uh, psychiatrists who have looked at the life of Hitler and the top Nazis, they, none of them were psychopaths. Uh, they, uh, they all had traits that fed into this, uh, this idea that uh, attracted this banality of evil that uh, Hannah Arendt uh, uh, talked about and Isaiah Berlin really talked about in a different way. But these, a couple of these traits, uh, and we can look at Putin uh, as an example, uh, these are in many... Uh, uh, tyrants, and these have to do with narcissism, what used to be called malignant narcissism, but narcissism is a key uh, to almost all the dictators. But I, I'm going to put a twist on it that uh, may be slightly unsettling. Uh, besides that, you know, some of them are schizotypals, they have schizoaffective disorder, uh, some are sadists, but these are not necessary things, but almost all of them are, are narcissists. And in looking for information from the diplomatic community and psychiatric community on Putin, there's very little there. And even people who know them uh, know him. He's very secretive about it. And this, this is a long tradition of this, is you never really know exactly what they're doing. One psychiatrist friend of mine who, who's also a, a sports uh, psychiatrist, if you will, he says he's just a narcissist uh, uh, injecting testosterone a little too much. He, he has all the behaviors of that. So I don't want to presume that there's anything more complicated going on than that, you know, in his mind, and, and to presume that. But if we look at uh, uh, psychopathy, there are two major parts of this that, that apply for dictatorships. One is uh, called fearless dominance. Now, fearless dominance is a trait that is in what's called the PPI. It's a psychopathy uh, index. And there was a study done uh, and released about a year and a half ago, a scientific study, where all of the biographers of U.S. presidents were, were taken and across this dimension of psychopathy called fearless dominance, a large, large part of it. Fearless dominance is what uh, uh, provides a person, a leader, with that light when they walk in the room. They all have it. There's a confidence, an arrogance, a, a chutzpah, 
at right, just the right amount that people immediately connect with. And they all see that light. And, and it's, but it goes beyond that. So in the study of these American presidents, it turns out the person with the highest amount of this psychopathy of fearless dominance was, was Ted Roosevelt. Then FDR, then JFK. Bill Clinton was right up there at the top. Uh, down at the bottom were the, were the mentions, really. You know, the, the Jimmy Carters, uh, Gerald Fords, but also Bush the Senior. Now, Bush the Senior was very low in psychopathy. Bush Jr. was quite high up there. He, he just nestled right with Bill Clinton. And, and so that's, I mean, it's kind of a, a, it says a funny thing, but it's very telling because those traits associate with what's considered leadership. And people are naturally attracted to it. And, and, and these traits include uh, what some say would be pathological lying and stealing, but they're lying for us. And so as long as a leader does that, we can temporarily, under the conditions, because this is in a cultural and historical uh, context that it's done, not the same for every uh, culture, but they lie for us, you know, we, FDR had to lie, but God, God you know, we, we beat Hitler, you know, with, with the rest of the world. And so we say it's okay. When real psychopaths do it, we, we hate it, okay? We really hate it. But if people are stealing for us and they're lying for us, we vote them in. And it's just a weakness we have. So part of my, what I've been considered the shared society is the sharing of the responsibility for either voting in a tyrant, these tyrants, or once they're in and they seem to mutate into you know, all this antisocial and deadly uh, traits, that we tolerate it. And part of the shared society is the, you know, the inability or the refusal, as Roman said, of people who see this emerging and, and coming out of its shell from, from somebody, maybe perhaps like a Putin, but certainly many others, that they really don't do anything about it. And so part of the shared society, the shared government, has to be uh, uh, people who either vote them in and or uh, continue to say nothing. Okay, so that's, uh, we all know that. Now, well, one of the things about this is that there's a biological basis for this. And, you know, people in the humanities, and people in the social sciences, political sciences, the arts, they don't like to hear about this. They don't like to hear anything, you know, it's genetic. It's just give, gives people the willies. Nonetheless, there's a lot of good evidence. Well, one curious thing, uh, it was just a matter of interest, is that those pro-social sorts of psychopathic traits, like fearless dominance, and this uh, manipulativeness, and this charisma, et cetera, all those traits, not the criminal traits per se, but those uh, may be passed down from the mothers to the sons. Whereas the more criminal traits, that, those, that uh, uh, the aggressive criminality, it looks like, and this is work by Sasha Reed at the University of Toronto, kind of an inspired graduate student I work with, that, the, that part, it was more passed from the fathers, uh, mostly to the sons, but it can be if you get a convergence of parents uh, to the daughters too. So you can have a tyrant uh, daughter and a, a woman. And so the thing is that it seems to be a large genetic component and we have to learn uh, to, to deal with this. And you know, you guys have got to wait for our generation to die. But you've got to make sure that your generation doesn't ha just have notions. You've got to be biologically hip of what this is about. This is biological psychiatry. Because it's part of just understanding people. And if we try to understand Putin, for which we have very little uh, unclass, non-classified ev uh, evidence of what he's about psychiatrically, another part has to do with empathy. And this is just the, the second thing. Now, empathy uh, is, is really... Uh, just, a couple of ways to cut empathy. Usually think of empathy as somebody who feels your pain, and that is true, that's called emotional empathy, but there's cognitive empathy too. Like I understand that person or group is in pain, I don't feel their pain, but we, got, you know, we have to uh, you know, provide charity and funds for them. And, and those are separate things. But there's another part of this that sort of overlaps with that, is there's an empathy for either uh, your group, your family, or for nation, larger group. And these levels of tribal uh, affiliation and empathy are also heavily genetically affected, impacted. And by certain alleles that you, if you happen to inherit these uh, vasopressin receptor, oxytocin receptor, testosterone receptor, there's a bunch of these different uh, genes. If you get all of them, you can tend to be a completely empathetic person, somebody you want to marry and have a family with. And they don't care at all about nation. And this is important because to get people, there's a whole group of people who will never care about nation. 
And it, they're driven by their genetics. You can talk to them and they can say, yeah, I understand that. But they won't. And you have, so we have to understand there's a, there's a large group uh, that will never care about the tribal association, but more than that, about world peace, which is the most broadest, the broadest sort of view of this. Uh, and there are some people uh, quite the opposite. Many of us are in the middle. You kind of think of this as 20%, 60%, 20%. 20% on the very high end of this emotional empathy, 20% 20, 20 uh, with this very nationalistic one. And Steve Brand uh, in the Moscow Times had a great article yesterday on you know, Putin's vision for this new Russian nationalism, this, this new identity. But, but, and this is the last thing I want to point out, is that there is a, a new data in the past a couple of years that indicate that even though you are born with a certain genome, that what really determines your behavior is your so-called epigenome, which is your genome with parts turned off. What turns those off those parts, and which ends up being expressed in your behavior, is greatly affected by early abandonment and by early abuse. And there's a, quite a great uh, biological reason now to be good to your kids, right? It's not just happy talk. And also to be good to your neighbor's kids and to make sure that there are not continuing neighborhoods, whether they're in the Middle East or in LA, wherever, where the kids are seeing continual violence. And this violence, this type of violence, is used by tyrants against others, but it ends up destroying their own people. And there's now uh, a, a pretty good evidence for this. So the only way to convince somebody for peace is not by just saying it, but by proving it to them that their ob obnoxiousness and their uh, tyrancy ends up killing their own group. And that's what happens. That's what happens in warrior cultures. The problem is you, it's very hard to get rid of these, because once you have them, they can last hundreds of years. So this goes with the idea of really the biological underpinning, the biobehavioral underpinning, that it takes time to reverse this. Just like, you know, uh, uh, Norway has gone from, uh, Vikings were the other way, uh, into this Jantelouven society. They've had a hundred years of this. And there's good reason to believe that that sort of uh, disgust empathy and good behavior can actually change the epigenome of people in what kind of children you have. Uh, and it goes the other way too. And so, but in order to get back, to get rid of those epigenetic markers, if you will, it's gonna take generations. Uh, I think in Ukraine and in anywhere. And if you look at the Russians, I mean, you know, Russians had a great society, they, but they've always had, for hundreds of years, you know, Putin is, is one of the czarist police, I mean, who's just become a czar. It's not, it's nothing to do with the Soviet Union, but something in the, uh, the long-term Russian psyche, and maybe their genome. And I know Putin mentioned the, the superiority of the Russian genome. He may not have got it exactly right. Uh, it may be, there may be a superiority fed by, uh, by hundreds and hundreds of years of, of the, the way they feel about themselves, but also pain, you know, and, and a lot of hardship. And it's happened in, in Ukraine too. So I think the only message is, we, I, th I think your group is gonna have to be, become more and more hip to this new uh, information, genetics and psychiatry and everything. Uh, but also it's gonna be uneasy because people think, or in the public discourse, that neuroscience and genetics is, is gonna free society. And it, this is gonna get worse before it gets better because there's a lot of bad news involved. Because uh, we're not all the same, our sense of justice is going to be challenged, our, our sense of accountability is going to be challenged, and how we adjudicate all sorts of things. So we're going to go through a rough uh, couple of patches in trying to integrate, uh, uh, you know, the, the new science. It's just, it's, it's really a science that goes back uh, uh, much further. You just, we're just starting to realize how this happens. And, and so uh, I, I just want to support what I heard, and also especially, Roman, your, uh, the, the message to you on the, on the biology of this. It, it supports the idea, but it ain't easy, and it's not going to be easy. So thank you. Jim, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Jim, I, I want you to, well, stay up here, because you're going to get a question, I know. Um,
We, uh, we've talked a lot about shared societies today, and tomorrow there's going to be two sessions specifically about uh, the Club of Madrid's uh, shared society. Um, as Ingrid pointed out, uh, we have the Deputy Secretary General, Marie uh, um, uh, Elena Aguero here, and, uh, and it's sort of sometimes during the session today I've been thinking, what is Marie thinking we're doing to her shared societies? Um, but if you have any comments, you, uh, I, I want you to speak up. Tomorrow we have the primary architect of the uh, shared societies, I think I can say that, uh, Clem McCartney, uh, in, in two sessions. So you'll, you'll hear much more tomorrow about what this shared society concept is all about. Um, but I'd like to, as I said, we, we, we need to be done precisely at uh, 12 o'clock, and uh, so we have six minutes. So if you, anyone has a question for Jim, I knew Tom would. Um, but uh, Tom, your question, and Jim, your answer. Uh, is it true that a lot of this is set in place by the age of two? And secondly, what we're really talking about here is the inheritance of acquired characteristics, right? Which, I mean, there was a theory of Lamarck in the 19th century which said that. How, how does this differ from what, what that old theory used to say? Yeah, I, I, I grew up, as you did, laughing at Lamarck. Yeah. It was a biologist. This was a joke. We're not laughing anymore. The thing is, we found, you know, first of all, you know, twins, identical twins are not even close to being identical at all. There are a lot of assumptions, because there are all sorts of other parts of the genome that we've picked up from viruses and bacteria that modify of, of who we are, but it especially affects our social brain, the prefrontal cortex, which has to do with morality, ethics, and how we treat each other. So that's especially vulnerable. And, and, and there are three really vulnerable times in your life. Uh, where this epigenetic marking can occur, and, and, and which will really change who you are. Uh, not who you are, but you know, your traits. And one is right uh, after birth, I mean right after conception. There's a few weeks after conception where if there's anything happening in terms of maternal stress, it's really bad news. The next highest point is when you're born. The day of birth, from then on, for Tom said, for like two or three years, uh, and then it kind of trails off. That is when uh, the, the genome of the child is very susceptible to abandonment, which is exactly like uh, heavy abuse, or, uh, or, or abuse itself. And I'm going to talk about a little stress, because you have to have some stress. No stress is bad. Uh, a lot of stress, this is not good. Now, the thing is that the people who are susceptible have to have a certain genetic uh, the composition, because not everybody is vulnerable. And so maybe, again, about 20% of kids are very vulnerable uh, to, to abuse and abandonment. Uh, the others are just so tough, you know, they're just they're at the opposite end. They may grow up to be angry that they got, but they, they don't have a personality disorder. I mean, they don't become a pernicious part of society. So, you know, in those cases, those 20% or so, then environment means everything. Uh, for the other 20% at the other end, it means very little. It's just they're ready to go and they're going to be who they are. Okay? And then most people are in the middle because you get a mix. Every one of these behaviors is affected by about 15 genes at least, not just one. And so that's the idea of vulnerability. And uh, boy, right from the day of birth onward, and then after about three years old, it really kind of trails off. It's good news and bad news. Uh, it's basically like when a kid is born, their frontal lobe is open, their social brain is open, and it's affected by a couple of genes, with the serotonin the transporter, and these other warrior genes. And the idea that we'll call warrior genes is because if a kid had these alleles, and for gene, these genetic alleles, and they were abused or abandoned, they grew up to be very dangerous people. This is where psychopaths come from. But on the other hand, and this was a marvelous thing, there's always a little good news with all this. It's, it's, it's always a wash. It's never good or bad news, but it's just, and it turns out that just the past uh, two years, if you have some of these warrior genes, uh, if you're treated really well, it negates everything else. So it really, you turn into like a sweet person. So in some of these people, it's like the frontal lobe opens up and says, what kind of world am I born into? If it's a hostile world, the only way to survive, it's about survival. Uh, the only way to survive is to be hostile yourself. If you're brought into a very kind world, that, that frontal lobe opens up, and after about two, it kind of closes down, it's kind of fixed, and it says this is a loving world. And you get a completely different kind of person. 
even with the same genes. So it's, it's very important. I never believed this. I never believed the Lamarck stuff. And I was, you know, wrong about it. And so it really is uh, turning out this way. And so it's, it's changed the way we obviously think about behavior, but also social behavior. Because the, the, the percent of these people that are interacting in any culture, if you have a high percentage of them, because of years of interbreeding in a hostile zone, you end up with a very high, higher and higher number. This has not been proven yet. It's, a, it's, it's something that needs to be done. Uh, but we think that's the way it's going to, to go. And it's and, and, and something I think that most uh, nations and most uh, peacekeeping you know, organizations uh, should know, how this, how this will play out. You can predict it.